Welcome to the first of our new podcast series. I will be having discussions with experts in many fields to bring you information you can use today to enhance your wellness. And we are so lucky to start our series with Ping Ho and the topic too. This podcast will help you learn how to use the arts to enhance healing and well-being. Ping Ho is a talented and creative woman in her own right and is the founding director of the UCLA Arts and Healing Program. This is the program she created as, in her own words, a vehicle for transformation and empowerment, two of my favorite topics. Ping is also uniquely qualified for this role. She was the original and the founding administrator for the Cousins Center for Psychoneuroimmunology, a very famous center at UCLA involving Norman Cousins, who said that you can laugh your way back to health. Her undergraduate degree was a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in counseling with a specialization in exercise physiology, and I think the degree that really led her to her current work, a master's of public health focusing on community health services. She has many other activities, committees that she serves on, and honors, which are unfortunately too numerous to mention now. So Ping, dear friend, creative scholar, welcome. Thank you so much, Mary. The very first thing that I want to say is that whenever I talk to audiences, I always just say, you know, how many of you have ever either said to yourself or heard someone say, oh, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't draw, I can't act, I can't write? And almost everybody's hand goes up. And then I ask, how many of you know people who do it anyway, even if they're not terribly good at it? And again, almost everyone's hand goes up. And so for all listeners, I just want to state right up front, that this is for everyone. We are talking about a process of creative expression, not perfectionism or product. So I just wanted to say that out front. I think that's a critical point. I actually believe that the creative urge is an inherent human urge in all of us and a function all of us have. And we know that the arts go back at least 35 to 50,000 years looking at cave paintings, etc. So This is a deeply human expression, and unfortunately, many of us have had those kind of art classes in school where they tell you you have to draw it the one way, and this is really just a tool for you to become more in touch with your own intuition, your own creativity, and to broaden your world. And so I agree with you. Everybody's welcome. It's a great way to start this. So what do you mean by the arts anyway, Ping? Is it something that we appreciate in museums and concert halls or What do we include in the arts? Well, for the sake of definition, we're going to call the arts creative activity that involves an aesthetic component. Uh Um, Frankly, I define the arts rather broadly. So, for example, it's not just dance, but it's movement. Uh Um, And, in fact, many things can be creative. Gardening can be creative. Cooking can be creative. So, theoretically, anything could be a creative activity. But for the purposes of defining what we do As an organization, we focus on the traditional art forms, visual arts, music, dance, drama, writing, for example, drumming, and that's where we draw the lines, but anything can be creative. So anything that gets you to express yourself, maybe how you dress or something like that could also be creative expression. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you think the arts can help during serious medical illnesses? Well, I'll first address what I think the inherent benefits of the arts are and then how to maximize those benefits. And then I'll mention how what we know is helpful to people in medical context. The first thing is that the arts in general externalize what's within. So it's like a window to our soul. And the arts are also uniquely well-suited to enhance positive emotions. Mm -hmm. There are many therapeutic approaches out there in the community that will help us reduce negative emotions, but very few that actually enhance positive emotions. You'll find in group arts activities that there's a lot of laughing that goes on. And Norman Cousins used to say that laughter was a metaphor for the full range of positive emotions. The other thing is the arts are universal. And they have a nonverbal component, which enables participation by people even who have no words. And the other thing, too, about uh, creative expression is it involves needing to be in the present moment. Because when you are expressing yourself creatively, you are literally staying in each moment in order to shape the next which takes your mind off of other things. You can't be judging yourself while you do this. Or worrying about the future or regretting the past. 
Exactly. You are mm-hmm. just in that moment. Mm-hmm. And um, and so because of all these things, the arts allow our difficult issues to come up in a more organic way that feels psychologically safe. And this is particularly important for people who've experienced trauma or are unable to articulate intense feelings that they have. And one of the reasons why the arts is so powerful is that they involve what we call synchrony, which is like empathy. And that sometimes synchrony is literal, like your group of people singing and singing the same notes or doing the same movement or playing the same rhythm. But sometimes it's not literal. And sometimes it's that someone agreed with you or validated or just listened to you and heard you and gave you that feeling that what you had to share was important. And those are the ways in which all the arts really uh, are empowering and transformative. I can give you a couple of examples. We had an inspirational music workshop the other day where people brought in a piece of music that they found inspirational, plus the lyrics, and everyone in the group listened together and read the lyrics together. And then the person who brought the piece in was asked to share what the meaning of that piece was to them. Mm -hmm. And then we opened it up to discussion with the rest of the group and the other members would say, oh, I could really relate to this line or, oh, they played that song at my wedding and, oh, that's one of my favorite ones. And it was a form of external validation. It's very safe to bring in a piece of music because you didn't write it. Right. But it's a way of saying this is who I am. This means something to me. This touches my heart. This reflects a pain that I've gone through or whatever it is. And you're totally validated when other people acknowledge that. That's one of the ways in which synchrony works. So wellness and, karaoke. Uh, yes, there you go. I love it. <laughs> and what happens in our writing programs is that people will end up writing things and sharing things that they have never shared with anyone before. What I find fascinating is that the number of people who tend to share traumas that they've never shared before matches the statistics in, that I read uh, mm-hmm. on the Internet about one in four or one in five people having undergone some sort of sexual, emotional, or other trauma. Mm-hmm. And what ends up happening is as soon as one person shares it, other people start saying, oh, I've had that experience. Mm-hmm. Then there's tears and there's bonding and within the space of an hour a group of entire strangers becomes each other's closest confidants Mm. Um, I see this time and time again so the other beautiful thing about the arts in general is there are virtually no side effects and there's no stigma of of therapy when you take all that into consideration it's a very very powerful tool for public health and wellness and when we focus on the process of creative expression and we Mm -hmm. take away the product or performance element or minimize it, then it allows for deeper reflection and dialogue Mm -hmm. and engagement, which leads to the health and wellness benefits. That's true. The other thing, you know, Ping, that I've trained as an artist. So I value as much the changes that practicing art make in me as whatever the product is that I produce. When I've spent a day working I come out and I'm much more passionately engaged and appreciative of what I'm everything I look at because I've spent four or five hours looking deeply. So I think it really does create changes in just how you go to look at the world. But one thing I think that's particularly useful in the patients who are facing, let's say, cancer or an illness like that is that I think the arts are also not just a great way to raise traumatic issues, but it's a terrific way to explore meaning. Mm -hmm. What about this experience allows you to transcend this experience? And I think that's tremendously comforting and beneficial. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a whole spectrum, meaning, self-awareness, empathy, connection to others. All of these things are powerful. And we know from the field of psychoneuroimmunology that stress reduction and social support actually improves our health. In fact, the most rigorous studies, the ones where there's randomized control trials, for example, of uh, the use of creative arts in medical contexts actually Uh shows 
biological evidence of stress reduction mm -hmm. when you take a look at neuroendocrine, neuroimmune, autonomic nervous system, and pain measures. Mm -hmm. And there's a brand new study that just came out that analyzed a whole bunch of uh, creative arts therapy studies. And actually, I should clarify that creative arts therapists are dually trained in the arts and in specific art forms and mental health. These people actually are skilled at taking the practices we talked about, the process of creative expression, and helping people identify their goals and develop individualized treatment plans. So right. they're op functioning as therapists. Um, this is kind of like the ultimate Application. version of what we're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a study of creative arts therapies outcomes actually showed significant reductions in depression, anxiety, and pain, and a significant increases in quality of life when you take a look at randomized controlled trials as a whole. And I did want to specifically also mention that what we've noticed is when people are disconnected from their body somehow, yeah. like they've had a medical procedure, they really benefit from creative movement and dance in forms that are less structured because mm -hmm. then they can tune into what their bodies need and reconnect and have control. It's a lot about regaining control over one's body and oneself. Certainly when um, people um, become chronically ill and really dependent on the medical system, at, for a time, hopefully not permanently, but maybe permanently, that loss of focus of control and that lack of empowerment creates a lot of pain and suffering. And so returning people to a comfortable sense with their own body is a wonderful thing to do. So just for one second, I want to go back to your, your large study. So this was a meta-analysis. We've talked on our blog about what that kind of a study is. It takes 10, 20, however many studies there are in an area and puts them together to make a more powerful super study out of this. And what I understand you're saying is that Malleaves is sort of make you quote unquote feel better, but this took the most rigorous studies and did the most rigorous analysis and showed concrete benefits in reduction of depression, reduction of anxiety, and reduction of pain at the same time increasing quality of life. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was a drug, it would be a billion dollar seller. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And actually, the article said that for depression, uh -huh. the effects were similar to those reported in other complementary and alternative studies right. uh, looking at uh, meditation, yoga, acupuncture, massage, for example. So that's yeah. pretty powerful. And no side effects, so it's not going to make you constipated or nauseated or anything like that. Yeah, you can keep doing it on your own, too. Right, right. And I think that's the thing also to say that this was a very structured intervention with a therapist present, but even just the act of creating yourself is useful. I actually, when patients are having insomnia, one of the things I like to ask them to do is to do a journal before they go to bed. And I specifically resist them writing, unless it's poetry. Because I don't want the 11 o'clock news report. I want them to have a chance to, again, like you said, surface anything that's been bugging them during the day, especially a verbally. That's the other half of our brain chiming in, which doesn't usually get heard. And they do that for 15 minutes, close the journal, go to bed. And then they're not sitting in the dark having these feelings come up because it's the first time they've gotten quiet all day. So I think that can help with insomnia as well, as a reduction of anxiety, probably. That's so. a wonderful prescription that you give. <laughs> right, right. And those of people who are listening and have been my patients know that I often do, and I think it's a really useful thing. So I also want to, I know you have a special interest in drumming, and I think many of us don't have a lot of access or a lot of experience with that art form. So I'd like to give you a chance to talk about the study you did, which was very interesting, and then tell us how people could participate in either a drumming group or even in their own home, how they could do that kind of a practice? Well, we actually did our study on low-income children because we actually know that low-income children experience stressors that result in having visible behavior problems in school, for example, mm -hmm. such as anxiety, depressed behavior, and or post-traumatic stress. They're not able to take in things that are being taught to them. So what we did was we actually developed a, a hybrid intervention where we combined group drumming activities with group counseling activities to teach social emotional skills. Drumming was the framework in which we were actually delivering social emotional skills 
And the beautiful thing about drumming is that boys and girls both like it. Anyone can do it. We all have a heartbeat. We can all keep a rhythm. So it's very inclusive. Many cultures, I think every culture has drumming as part of its artistic expression. So we felt that it was a really good blend with the counseling activities. And what we found really surprised us. We actually used a very comprehensive measure of behavior. We weren't actually sure what we were going to see change. Um, Out of 22 possible or 24 possible Uh subscales, we actually found changes in 11 of them. We were amazed. It was things ranging from withdrawn, depressed behavior, anxious behavior, a post-traumatic stress behavior, attention deficit hyperactivity behavior. Uh Let's see, we had... uh, Uh, sluggish cognitive tempo, um, oppositional defiant behavior, and Mm -hmm. a lot on the attention. There were quite a few attention-related subscales. So what we felt was um, that we found something of potentially great public health value because of Mm -hmm. the wide variety of ways in which children express stress. And Mm -hmm. I think the main thing that I wanted to point out was we designed this study to be sustainable. With my public health background, I was not going to engage in anything unsustainable. So um, we actually developed the program to be Uh deliverable by a non-music specialist. So the the counselor we taught it to um, actually had no music background. Uh And we have turned it into a scripted manual now so anyone can deliver it. We've we've now since um, seen actors, college students, um, uh-huh. mental health professionals. We trained an entire division in the Los Angeles Unified School District. What a great thing. Um, so that's the really exciting thing. Um, we actually set a very high bar for ourselves. and We chose uh-huh. to work with fifth graders, the most difficult age group to work with in elementary school because uh-huh. they're about to go off to middle school. Right. And we did it in spring semester, which is the worst time of year to ever right. try to do anything with a student. And we figured if we, under this circumstance, if we could find significant effects, then it would give us a lot more confidence in the strength of our intervention. So we're excited about offering this tool to the public. We do offer training programs. We find that it's extremely well received and effective wherever it's delivered. Kids yeah. love it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a big bass drum. It can be something you can turn over an empty uh, cereal box and you can you can tap along to a song that you're listening to so you can get some of these mm-hmm. benefits without making it a, a big production, as you would say. So You can use five-gallon water jugs. They just make uh-huh. a great sound. Turn them over, um, yep. plastic ones, or yep. paint buckets. Uh Um, You can Uh make your own drums, too, out of Quaker oatmeal boxes and things like that. Having been in one of your drumming circles, the other thing is it just feels like you're part of a group because obviously you are doing the thing together. And I imagine there's a lot of people with social isolation and other kinds of issues that finding a drumming group would be helpful for that, too. So Yes, there is something very gratifying. Um, Drumming is can simultaneously be uh, stimulating uh-huh. and it can also be calming. Um, you're mm-hmm. actually doing something physical mm-hmm. and at the same time, when you get into a regular rhythm, it is mm-hmm. very calming and um, organizing. Um, mm-hmm. So for example, children or people with special needs uh-huh. who have a difficult time focusing, yes. it helps them focus and organize their thinking Interesting to be involved in a rhythmic activity like that. Terrific. Terrific. It'd be interesting yeah. to see a study on a chemo brain, for example. That would be an interesting thing to see if that would help that process as well. I wouldn't be surprised um, because I actually forgot to mention, this is kind of important, but that study um, mm-hmm. that I was telling you about of uh-huh. the effects for um, the beneficial effects on depression, anxiety, and so forth was actually with a focus on cancer. Yes, good, terrific. So many of these things you could transfer into the hospital if you have to go to the hospital because you can bring your own music with you, you can hang up your own art, you can write and do a journal, make poetry, get one of those little magnetic poetry things and start to create art on your refrigerator door. Exactly. I keep thinking of patients in in the room and all they have are these television channels. Just horrible stuff, just horrible stuff. And yeah. and holding a book doesn't always feel good when you have IVs or if you're in pain or you're tired. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, listening to music or if they are going to use their hands, sketching mm-hmm. or something, uh-huh. these are really simple ways that people could be engaged. And writing is a quiet uh-huh. activity. It just makes a lot of sense because mm-hmm. the medical 
setting is not geared towards helping people with their psychosocial needs. Yeah, because they're doing the important and useful, and, and we're not degrading this, but they're doing the important work of keeping the body alive. That's why we have to take extra attention on the soul and the mind. I think it's true. Yes, and engages cooperation, too, from the patients sure. when they're happy and they feel listened to. And, and like you're suggesting, they don't necessarily need to have a human being sitting there listening to them if they can actually put their feelings and their words onto a piece of paper, for example. And listen to themselves. Exactly, so, or share with loved ones who come to visit. And that's the thing we haven't really touched on, that this, that these interventions, we focus a lot on the patient, but uh, the stress for someone who's standing beside watching a patient go through a serious illness can oftentimes be as stressful or worse than the person who's actually the, the patient. So how about family, friends, loved ones? Have you done this work with that group as well? Oh, yes. We did a family night for Venice Family Clinic and mm -hmm. uh, where people brought their children. And there was one mother who was blown away seeing her, quote unquote, ADHD child so engaged and gifted at the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden she thought, you know, I want more of this for my son. Mm -hmm. It made him feel so good about himself. It made her feel good about it. And it was something right. the whole family could do together. Yeah, sure. And that's the other thing about but the group work is people get a chance to see each other in a different context. And that's really what builds a lot of empathy and, and, and connection, mm -hmm. which we are so deeply needing in this very electronic society that we live in. That's for sure. And the other really beautiful thing about the creative arts in general is there are outstanding ways to connect with people with special needs, for uh -huh. example, with autism spectrum disorder, sure. and also with mental illness, where uh -huh. regular dialogue isn't the Possible. norm. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think you've given us a really inspiring look at this field broadly. We're going to definitely have you come back, and we might focus on a particular area again and, and maybe hone down on one of them. If you want to learn more about Ping Ho, about the arts, or about her wonderful program, UCLA Arts and Healing, you can find it at her website, uclaartsandhealing.net. We're going to have a copy of the paper she talked about on the website, and we're also going to have a Why I Like It, so you can find that address more easily. You can also look forward to us, and Ping's going to help us do this, getting started documents so that you can figure out if you want to get started writing, you want to get started as an artist, what are some real simple ways to do that? So, Ping, deeply, deeply grateful to you for coming today and sharing your enthusiasm, your creativity, and your expertise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for this opportunity and for the incredible work that you're doing for the community. It's, um, it's my passion and my dharma, and I'm so grateful to have a place to do it and friends to do it with me. So that's it for our first podcast, and we will talk with all of you again soon. <laughs>